It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the impervious John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing this morning, John? Excellent. How are you doing today, Andy? Oh, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll, John. I mean, we have one of my favorite writers here to, the, to discuss. And uh, and the the title of this show is a uh, Rostan Edmond Rostan, the author of the three greatest plays in in history. Maybe, maybe we should take a, a minute to clue in the audience as as to why we you know why we picked that title. Yeah, you yeah, think? you you know this story firsthand, don't you? Yeah, I was there. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember what year it was. Late seventies or early eighties. It was towards the end of Ayn Rand's life. Uh, Leonard Peikoff was lecturing, you know, in New York City, the old, you know, the old uh, Statler, the old, was it the Statler Hilton, I think? Um, on Seventh Avenue, right across the street from, from Madison Square Garden. Anyhow, Ayn Rand uh, appeared in, in some of the uh, question and answer periods when Dr. Peikoff was lecturing back then, which was a real treat. Uh, and somebody asked her in the Q&A, said, Miss Rand, can you name uh, what, 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 are, what are the three greatest plays in history? And Ayn Rand responded, that's easy. Sienno de Bergerac three times. So that's, uh, that's, where, that's why we picked that title for this show. Yeah, that's a great story. And it really is just an amazing play. I, I'll have to say, you know, I'm not a, an expert in the history of, of drama at all. And, uh, you know, relatively uneducated, unfortunately, in this this part of uh, of the humanities, but I, I've read this one a couple times, and it's just it's a heartbreaker, and I love it. So I'm glad we get yeah. to talk about Rostand today and Cyrano in particular, whose birthday, by the way, Edmund Rostand, born on April Fool's Day, pretty fitting since he was such a a, a wit in so many of his plays. Look at that mustache, John. I mean, maybe you could grow yours <laughs> like that. Well, I bet Rosie would like that. She said, "Ooh, my Doubtful. man, he's looking Doubtful. hot." <laughs> but we we admired we admired George Westinghouse's mustache last week, you know, and, and justly so. Well, Rostan's doing a pretty good job there, also. He's got the handlebars, and uh, Westinghouse, of course, has got the walrus going on. I don't yeah. think I could pull yeah. either of those off, and I'm All not right. going to well, try. Well, you got the beard going <laughs> on, so you, you're as manly as can be. So, uh, Rostan author of Cyrano de Bergerac, the brilliant play that we're, you know, that we're going to discuss, dates 1868 to 1918. And I was reminded, sadly, of, of Rostan's death when this, whole, when this pandemic really got started. About, you know, it was last March, I think, when, when it really hit uh, here in, in, in the United States. It was about you know, a little more than a year ago. Was, I was, thought of that, that uh, Amon Rostan died in the Spanish flu pandemic that followed World War One, I. I don't remember how many tens of millions of people around the world died from the Spanish flu. So um, uh, you know, that's you know horrifying, and uh, uh, unfortunately, Rostam was one of them. But, yeah, it's um, sad the talent yeah. snuffed out by that pandemic, and just to think what what could be happening now, and and the the potential playwrights and artists now that are in the midst of their life's work. It's it's very sad. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the thing, you know, it's, it's only 100 years ago, and yet it could have been a, it's like a different world because there were the, no antibiotics back in 1918 and certainly no antiviral, you know, medications. So, you know, for the most part, I mean, I don't know anything about medicine, but, from, you know, what little I, 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 I've heard, you know, for the most part, your, your immune system fought off, fought off the germs and you survived or it, it didn't. You know, whereas uh, yeah. you know, with the pandemic today, we have uh, certainly in the advanced countries, we have so mu much more sophisticated medications that it, it the, over the overwhelming majority of people who contracted uh, coronavirus survived. Right? Uh, I think the big difference that you don't have, what was it, 50 million people? I've heard 50 million people die from the Spanish flu. Some people say more. Uh, I don't know what the worldwide figures are so far for coronavirus. I don't, I, and we may never know the full truth because we, we may never get the numbers from China. You know, you know the communist regime is so dishonest. Uh, 
but I don't think I don't think it approximates. And from a much larger population, you know, in the world today than was back then, I don't think. Let's put this: way, I don't think we're going to approximate the percentage of human deaths, you know, that that you know, that there was from the Spanish flu. Yeah, and largely thanks to Louis Pasteur, who we've done an episode on, the father of vaccinology, uh, came up with you know the the rabies vaccine and. Uh, mm-hmm. Fam- famously popularized this approach to medicine. So thank you, Pasteur, yeah. for uh, lessening the impact. And of course, all of the people that have carried on in that vein of research and, and those who have uh, created the vaccine that we have today for COVID-19. Right, right. Yeah, I, Yes. yesterday I just got the second jab. So uh, I'm approaching 24 hours. I don't have any reaction yet. They say that for people who have the reaction to the second shot, it's usually on the second day. So um i'm a few minutes away from the 24 hours but so we'll see <laughs> but uh uh edward jenner also we want to thank edward jenner you know, who in the 1790s yes. in britain developed the vaccine for smallpox and i i remember reading somewhere john that in china the the vaccines going you know going back even further than that so you know human beings interested working on this yeah i i, I can't swear to that but i you know I've, but i've read that uh so yeah we want to thank all the the great medical people uh you know and today with the the uh the vaccines being rolled out you know relatively quickly uh it's gonna save it's gonna save a lot of lives unfortunately couldn't save rostan's life 100 years ago to see what the rest what what the body of work might have been had he lived to be say 80 rather than dying at mm. age 50. yeah but uh it's an interesting point john and everybody out there in hero land uh rostan was grew up in marseille you know, down along the Mediterranean. I remember, you know, I was reading about this and, and I was like pleasantly surprised. His father was an economist poet. <laughs> you know, yeah. now this, this is not a combination you find, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you find every day. E- 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 economics is, you know, Carl Lyle called it the dismal science, which most yeah. people take to mean he thought it was boring, but that's not the reason. <laughs> he, he called it, Carl Lyle called it the dismal science because he was an advocate of slavery and the economists were generally abolitionists. But that's another story for another day. Uh, an economist, poet, I think we should contact Thomas Sowell, who'll be 91 you know, in June and still work and say, Dr. Sowell, take up some, po- take up poetry. Uh, well, he's got his photography. Tra- so it's the poetry of, of the uh, the lens, I guess. There you go, there you go. But uh, his father translated Catullus. You know, the he did, great, uh, yeah. Great Latin and I poet. think there's a yeah, and I think there's a connection here to Cyrano, because Catullus is a passionate love uh, poet, poet. I mean, passion. You read Catullus to this day. You know, you, some people are shocked by the explicit sexual imagery in Catullus's poetry from the first century uh, BC. And uh, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, his fifth uh, Catullus, I think this is relevant to Cyrano as, as we'll see his his fifth Catullus's fifth poem is very famous I love the I love the opening line there's different translations of it but the, the translation I love is come lesbia let us live in love and and care not a fig what sour old men say <laughs> it's you know, it's, lovely yeah it's, you know, it's it's beautiful listen to this because I just again I I'm, I'm, I know we're not discussing Catullus today but I, th- I, th- I think we w- will be able to connect this t- to Cyrano. This is uh, Catullus's fifth poem, a different translation. Let us live, my lesbia, and love, and the rumors of stern old men, let us value at just one penny. Suns may <laughs> set and rise again. Suns may set and rise again, but for us, when once the brief light has set, an eternal night must be slept. Give me a thousand kisses, then a hundred more. It goes on, you know, in in in, uh, in that vein, and I think we'll be able to connect that to Cyrano. Not one, the the impassioned owed to romantic love, but also the independence, you know, that because I want to read a great you know passage from Cyrano, uh, extolling independence, but. Go back to my my favorite translation from of that first line from Catullus's uh, fifth poem. Come, lesbia, let us live in love and care not a fig what sour old men say. You know, we're gonna live, we're gonna love it. If other people don't like it, too bad. <laughs> yeah. 
And that's yeah, uh, I we'll, think we'll, that... we'll be able to connect that to yeah. soon. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Uh, definitely connections there. And, and it's really relevant that Eugene, his father, Eugene Rostand, he started his career as a barrister, I believe, as a lawyer and, and was known as a great orator. But then his family uh, ran uh, some banks. And so he became a president of the family bank in that region. And but all his life, he he worshipped poetry and, and wanted to become a poet. And his brother, Alexis, was a musician and wanted to become a musician. Uh, you know, neither of them pursued these careers professionally, but they did have some pretty great success, small level success compared to uh, what the son would later go on to do. But, you know, they would stay up late in the evening writing these oratorios together. And one of them, uh, titled Ruth, actually became pretty famous in Marseille when Rostand was two. So Rostand, uh, Edmund Rostand could not have grown up in a, in a better household or had a more perfect preparation for his life as a poet. Uh, you know, he was surrounded by music and poetry. In fact, you know, this is an age of, of entertaining in one's, in one's home. And whenever the, the, uh, when, whenever the family would have guests over, he would be encouraged to recite poetry and his, his sister Juliet would be encouraged to, to play the piano. So it was, uh, you know, his, his father said, remember that you, uh, that your life had a rosy morning. And I think that's true, although we should probably discuss just briefly the Franco-Prussian War that erupted when he was two. Yeah, which didn't turn out so well for the French, did it? But, no. but, but before, we, before we get to that, um, also, he went on, uh, not only, you know, Edmond to be a great poet himself, but he married uh, uh, an accomplished mm -hmm. poet, his, his wife, Rosamond, I'm not so great with the French. Rosamond Etiennette Girard was uh, was mm -hmm. also uh, you know was an was an accomplished poet. So it was in it was in his DNA, <laughs> John. It was certainly certainly in his consciousness. And you know, so you know, I think when we get to it, I'm going to argue is you know is the greatest ode to romantic love ever written. Uh, and I don't think it's an accident that his father was translating Catullus, the great yeah. love poet, the great love poet from from Rome. So I think there is there is some some connection there. But anyhow, so, and what, writing, so you want to what? Well, and, and you know, he wrote his own poems as well. He wrote and published two books, two volumes of poetry before Edmund was born, and and another two afterward. So he was a pretty accomplished poet in his in his own right. Yeah, the the Franco Prussian wow. War erupts when when Edmond is two. And this is really the only big event marking his childhood, other than this just beautiful preparation for his future life. But the family has to flee Marseille and they go to Nice for a while, and then on to the Pyrenees in, in uh, Luchon to escape the, the war. And as you said, yeah, it doesn't turn out great for the French, but fortunately the family escapes to safety and, uh, and then in the future makes their way back home to Marseille. Right. And it was a crushing blow spiritually for the French. You know, the, the, the culture was intensely nationalistic, you know, you know, French pride and everything. You know, Europe has, has often been been uh, plagued by jingoistic nationalism, that, you know, that led to any number of wars. World War One is the, you know, the bloodiest. But, you know, and this great pride in Napoleon and, you know, Napoleon had just, if I could quote Muhammad Ali, had just whopped them Prussians, you know, over and over again, you know, and, and uh, you know, they thought themselves superior, you know, to the Germans and everything. And then they just got crushed, you know, in the Franco-Prussian War. And, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a big blow to the French national pride, without a doubt. But anyhow, uh did you want to say anything else about the war before we move on? Nope. I think it's uh, maybe a good demonstration of the, the reasoning that pride in one's nation should be based on actual virtues, but uh, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Patriotism rather than nationalism, right? Yeah. You will stand up for your country when your country uh, protects individual rights and liberty rather than taking the attitude of my country right or wrong yeah exactly. you know that's a good that's a yeah right that's a good theme uh when, you know when we discussed the the white roads because you know mm -hmm. to the nazis they were traitors 
because they you know they they betrayed the the regime uh, that was controlling germany then but the white rose understood no 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 we we love germany what germany is at its best you know making all these tremendous advances in every intellectual field no, not when Germany is murdering, you know, millions of innocent civilians and plunging the world into a, you know, a bloody war. So, yeah, they, you see that that conflict between uh, nationalism and patriotism certainly played out, you know, in, the, in our in our show on the White Rose. But um, so 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 Edmond, did you want to discuss? I don't know that much about his his early childhood education other than what you just said. I know I know what he did in uh, in college. Did you? Was there anything else you, you want to say about his early education? before we go to his college years? No, I think it was pretty, pretty unremarkable other than that. It was just a, such a, a great preparation for him. Yeah, we can move on to his college years. Yeah, he went to Paris, right? The, uh, the college, uh, St Stan Stanislas. Um, but, mm -hmm. but what's interesting about this is he was a real, he was an inveterate humanities guy. I, I, humanities guy really yeah. resonated with me because you know, I'm the same, unfortunately, not literary genius like Rostam, but he studied literature, history, philosophy. So exactly what I studied, you know, in, in <laughs> he ran the gamut. He, he ran the gamut of the man-centered, you know, human-oriented disciplines. Good preparation for his his future career as a writer. And he went Which on, you got know. Got started pretty well, young. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, he died at 50, so he, he you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to, didn't have much time to work to, with. Uh, yeah, to achieve what he did, he, 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 it was necessary to start young. But all of his plays were were written in verse, right? They're all they're all poetic, um, and um, I don't really, like I said, I'm not good with the French, but Le, Le Romanesque is that how you pronounce that? Mm -hmm. Le, Le, the, which became, by the way, just you know, was something that I'm familiar with it became the basis of the off Broadway musical, The Fantastics. You know, you know, a hundred years, hundred years later, the the Fantastics, John. You know, based on Rostand's play, the Romanesque, ran for forty two years, from from nineteen sixty <laughs> to two thousand, from nineteen sixty to two thousand and two, you know, off Broadway. Uh, it was uh, so you know, it was a tremendous success, and I think a lot of our viewers will know the song. Try to remember. I'm not going to. Well, I'm not going to sing because nobody wants to hear me sing. Uh, but try to remember. I, I think Jerry Orbach was the was the actor singer who who you know who who uh, made that song famous. Beautiful song. You can just go up on YouTube and you know and and um, listen to it. But anyhow, it was based on a, on a, on a play by Edmond Rostand. So so that was one of his early. That was one of his early plays. He wrote he wrote for Sarah Bernhardt, didn't he? The the great actress. He did, yeah, the following year. So uh, Les Romanesques debuted in 1894, and um, it, he got the opportunity to write a play for the great actress Sarah Bernhardt. Uh, famous in her day, she appeared in plays by Dumas and, and Hugo and then Rostand. And she also didn't only play female characters, really interesting. She played male characters as well. She played Hamlet in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, so yeah, the first play that he writes for her debuts in 1895, The Princess Lontaine, I believe. That's how you pronounce it. Well, thank you for the pronunciation. And it was not uh, successful. I'm trying to remember. I know if um, it, when, it, when it premiered in London, it was panned mm -hmm. by George Bernard Shaw, uh, but yeah. that's not, but, but Shaw, wasn't a fan of the romantic style in which Rostan wrote anyway. So I, I don't know if that's, you know, how much of a recommendation or a, an anti-recommendation yeah. that is. But he wrote a play after it also uh, for, was it La Samartain? Also for, for Sarah, yep. the great Sarah Bernard, which was, there you go. You, we'll, we'll, we will, uh, you know, employ you for all the, the French pronunciations. You know, that... <laughs> That that was a much more that was a much more successful play, right? I think that that yeah, that's my understanding. Just, yeah, yeah, and you're right. He's young when when Le, Le Romanesque is 1894, so he's only 26 years old, and he's you know he's becoming a, you know a, a star, but his star really ascends with the production of Cyrano de Bergerac. Was that 1897? Was that was that the, yeah? It was 1897. 
Yes, absolutely. One of the greatest moments in French theater history. Yeah, with December the great 28th, actor. 1897. So it's practically 1898. Um, with the celebrated actor, Cochran, I think, is, is that how you pronounce his name? In yes. The, there you go. Tech guy is right on top of his stuff. There is <laughs> Cyrano, Cyrano de Bergerac. Uh, yeah, so it's 1897, 8, 1890, 1898. And it was, it was just a... A, an enormous hit. They they say it was the biggest hit uh, of a first of a, a, a first. What, what was it? Um, it, play, it played. <laughs> it played for more than three hundred consecutive nights, and then for for a drama written poetically, you know, in in verse, it was the biggest success since Hugo's Ernani in eighteen thirty. Yeah. That's almost you know seventy years uh prior yeah. but yeah it would it was an i mentioned success. before but, the book um uh, there's a beautiful book called the tale of the wind by k nolte smith who was actually a uh, or sometime an associate of ayn rand and a tale mm -hmm. of the wind is a beautiful book but in it, it it begins with the success of ernani and ends with the success of cyrano de bergerac and you get to see the dramatization of what was actually happening in Paris at the time. It's just really incredible. So I rec highly recommend everyone check out those scenes in that book. Yeah, I agree. Very, K. Nolte Smith was a very talented novelist who unfortunately died young from cancer. Uh, no, no telling you know, what, what, her, what her body of work uh, may have been if she, she had lived longer. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree. By the way, by the way um, K. Nolte Smith, one of K. Nolte Smith's novels was called Mind Spell. Uh, which was a really you know good story and very insightful on this paranormal you know it was it a serious theme on you know this, this these claims to the paranormal and esp and you know and and everything she did you know in the course of the plot she debunked she, she showed rational you know, kind of kind of things that the amazing randy james randy did in real life debunked <laughs> you know this stuff she did it very nicely in the novel in the novel mind spell you know, her hero showed in pattern, how you debunk this kind of these, these kind of claims. Be that as it may, uh, so Cyrano is a big success, and um, they bring it across the pond, right? I mean, I mean, it's, uh, on Broadway in in New York, early twentieth early twentieth century, Coughlin and Sarah Bernhard both played, uh, you know, in, starred in the play. Obviously, with Coughlin as Cyrano and Sarah Bernhard as Roxanne. Boy, you paid good money to see that production. <laughs> you know, of the, yeah. of the play. So, but I'm not going to context a little. Uh, we're in late nineteenth century, uh, late nineteenth century France, and the scene is really just dominated by cynicism and the artistic outlook of naturalism. This idea that we should portray life as it really is, and and we shouldn't have these sort of fake artificial quote unquote, stories about heroes and the like. There are no such thing as heroes. This is really sad time for culture. And, and uh, Rostand is really worried about how his play, Cyrano de Bergerac, is gonna be received because he's, he's realizing that he's appealing to this old fashioned, at this point, this old fashioned value of beauty and idealism and romanticism, you know, this, this, Romanticism being this school of art in which you're appealing to these broad, abstract values and uh, and uh, portraying those through heroic acts. And so he's, mm -hmm. you know, it's very uncertain how this play is going to do. And he ends up paying much of the production costs out of his own pocket. And the night before the premiere, he is weeping in his dressing room. And, and Rostan says to Coughlin, Forgive me, my friend, for having dragged you into this misadventure. And Coughlin says, there is nothing to forgive. You have given me a masterpiece. And then, you know, in the, this, this is just a, a tremendous moment. Like I said, one of the greatest moments in French uh, dramatic history. The, the, there are literally hours of curtain calls. Um, in fact, if I could, I just want to read, Lisa Van Damme has written a, a tremendous bit on this play at the end of a, a piece that she's published with us at the Objective Standard, uh, Enrich Your Life with Poetry. 
and uh, there's just this gorgeous paragraph explaining the reaction to Cyrano that, that I'd love to read. She said, yeah, go ahead, John. As it, as it turns out, opening night of Cyrano de Bergerac was one of the greatest, great historic moments of French theater. By the third act, ladies were throwing their gloves and men their opera hats on stage. The audience was invading the wings to congratulate Rostand and the actors. After the final act, the audience leaped as one to its feet and cheered for hours, literally. There were 40 curtain calls. Men who were supposed to fight duels the next day embraced and called them off. The crowd burst into a spontaneous rendition of the Marseillaise, the French national anthem. And one of Rostand's bitter rivals wrote in his journal that night, flowers, nothing but flowers, simply all the flowers for our great romantic poet. Coughlin, the actor who had called the play a masterpiece, would go on to play Cyrano in 995 productions during his lifetime. And according to Lloyd, Cyrano de Bergerac was the most unanimous triumph in the history of theater in France. Gives me chills. Wow. Yeah, that's great stuff. Wow. But what a slack of Coughlin was. Only 995. <laughs> he couldn't manage five more, make it to an even 1,000. That's a, that's a lot of, uh, yeah, that's a lot of performances. That, that's a great quote from, from Lisa Van Dam. And, you know, you reminded me of, uh, of something, John, because the, um, you know, the, yeah, the naturalistic movement is on the march late 19th, turn of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, um, Emile Zola is becoming the, uh, you know, the fa favorite author. And Zola has heroic qualities. I don't want to denigrate him. He's the, one, he's the one who stands up and speaks out on the Dreyfus, you know, and tells the truth yeah. on the, on the, on the Dreyfus. Dreyfus. Well, yeah. But, you know, as a, as a novelist, you know, he is a, he is a naturalist. I, 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 I made it through his novel Germinal once, but I, you know, it was like a literary duty. Is, is, it's, it's, it's arch naturalism. You know, people are, they're just human beings are, are, are weak. They're buffeted by their social conditioning. Uh, you know, and they're dominated by by the by their families or the political economic system. They don't have that inner strength to take charge of their own lives. Whereas, as you would say, with romantics, you know, and Ayn Rand, of course, points out that the essence of romanticism is it recognizes free will. That human beings make choices, and, and we can come out of you know out of crazy families or brutal cultures, and you know, make choices and 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 be heroes. To you know, choose real values life supporting values and stand up for them, you know, like uh, uh, Enjolras in Hugo's Les Miserables, you know, overthrow the, you know, the monarchy and establish a, you know, a, re a republic. And so, uh, so anyhow, when I was a kid, you know, I'm watching the, the you know, these, all these, these old time Hollywood movies from like 1930s, 1940s, I'm watching them on the late show, you know, on, on TV and the life of Zola, the life of Emile Zola starring, I think it was Paul Muni, the great, Great actor, Paul Muni. Uh, and what scene that stuck in my mind here was the, 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 you know, the, from the anti romanticism of Zola and the naturalist. He was a young guy, I think, and he was, you know, he was living in a garret during the winter. He didn't have, he didn't have money, you know, for for, for, for firewood. You know, and he he, he took the books from these romantic authors, probably Hugo. I don't, you know, I threw them in the in the fireplace. You know, he said, "Burn the books of the liars to keep an honest man warm." You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, ex you know, exactly. So you're right. That's the atmosphere in which Cyrano is is being birthed, and I could see why you know Rostand was you know was uh, disturbed about what the what its what its prospects might have been. But yeah, here's the paperback. Yeah, uh, Cyrano Cyrano de, de Bergerac. And I want to strongly recommend uh, anybody, to, if you're going to read it, to read the Hooker translation. Brian Hooker's translation, Hooker himself was a poet. Brian Hooker's translation is beautifully uh, po po poetical. I want to read uh, in, in just a minute a, a great passage from there. But first, I want to say, you know, I, don't want to, I don't want to lament the fact that I didn't get to see Coughlin or Sarah Bernhardt do Cyrano because I see some really good productions circa 1980. Uh, when I was in, a kid in grad school, the Royal Shakespeare did uh, Cyrano on, on Broadway with Derek Jacobi, you know, in the, in, the, in the title role. And he was just great. It was the first time Cyrano had been produced 
since in you know, like 30 years you know on, you know, on broadway uh, nobody wanted to do it after jose farrar version because jose farrar was so great and by the way the movie version uh done with jose farrar is also is just awesome the thing that sticks in my mind i haven't seen that movie in decades but the thing that sticks in my mind is that john that scene was she those fighting 100 guys <laughs> you know he's fighting 100 guys by 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 himself to to defend uh, his friend but um Regular, so i've gotten yeah. to see some yeah so i've gotten to see some great you know some great performances of of cyrano but um in fact i believe that's jose farrar as, Cier as cyrano won the on the uh, on the cover of, of this edition of the hooker translation i think that's what Zephyr looks like um anyhow uh wow w what a, what a play what a play cyrano is you could see why ayn rand when, when somebody asked ayn rand to name the three greatest plays of all time she, why she would respond that's easy cyrano de bergerac three times so we should get we yeah you know, we should discuss the story and the characters uh a little a little bit the love story here it's so touching. So it's, um, so I was going to say Cyrano and Roxanne are like John and Rosalie, but I, but I think your, I think your story, <laughs> you know, <laughs> your story is a, is a, is Better a ending. much, is a much, yeah, ab absolutely. <laughs> but, but Cyrano, there's, a, there's a certain way in which Cyrano, the character, is. A great deal like Howard Roth in in Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. He's a he's a he's an archetype of of independence. I mean, just he's a great he's a he's a great poet. He's a great playwright. But this is 17th century France. In order to in order to get your works produced, you have to you know the 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 arbiter of elegance, if I can quote what they used to call Petronius here in the court of Nero. Uh, the arbiter of elegance is the Cardinals, the Richelieu, and I think, and they had tremendous power, and you couldn't get anything produced without his patronage, and you have to kiss up to the Cardinal, in other words. And Cyrano's not going to do it. He just, you know, he he refuses, you know, he refuses to do it. And there's this, there's this brilliant passage here. I got, I've got to read this. Uh, it's lengthy but it's it's worth it's worth reading uh, the, the entire because his his friend uh labrette is urging him to not make so many enemies why you have to be so you know uh, obstreperous in the, in the in the face of people you know get a you know go along to get along kind of thing glad hand people yeah. slap backs kiss babies you know you know this is what this is what you should do uh rather than being so you know what was what was the uh, the cover of the current issue of the Objective Standard with the great Walter Williams, the late great Walter Williams, intransigent, intransigent individualist, right? Uh, Bosch yeah, Faustin, exactly. I assume Bosch Faustin, Bosch Faustin drew that. Looks like you know, yeah, it looks like it looks like his his great work. Uh, yeah, well, Cyrano is an intransigent individual. He's not gonna bend, you know, the, not not the slightest from his principles in order to make friends or you know to curry favor. So, Cyrano responds to his friend, what would you have me do? Seek for the patronage of some great man and like a creeping vine on a tall tree crawl upward where I cannot stand alone? No, thank you. Dedicate, as others do, poems to pawnbrokers? Be a buffoon in the vile hope of teasing out a smile on some cold face? No, thank you. Eat a toad for breakfast every morning? Make my knees callous and cultivate a supple spine? Wear out my belly groveling in the dust? No, thank you. Scratch the back of any swine that roots up gold for me? Tickle the horns of mammon with my left hand while my right, too proud to know his partner's business, takes in the fee? No, thank you. Use the fire God gave me to burn incense all day long under the nose of wood and stone? No, thank you. Shall I go leaping into ladies' laps and licking fingers? Or, to change the form, navigating with madrigals for oars, my sails full of the size of dowagers? No, thank you. Publish verses at my own expense? No, thank you. Be the patron saint of a small group of literary souls 
who dine together every Tuesday? No, I thank you. Shall I labor night and day to build a reputation on one song and never write another? Shall I find true genius only among geniuses, palpitate over little paragraphs, and struggle to insinuate my name in the columns of the mercury? No, thank you. Calculate, scheme, be afraid, love more to make a visit than a poem, seek introductions, favors, influences. No, thank you. No, I thank you. And again, I thank you. But to sing, to laugh, to dream, to walk in my own way and be alone, free, with an eye to see things as they are, a voice that means manhood, to cock my hat where I choose, at a word, a yes, a no, to fight, or right, to travel any road under the sun, under the stars, nor doubt if fame or fortune lie beyond the born, never to make a line I have not heard in my own heart, yet with all modesty to say, my soul, be satisfied with flowers, with fruit, with weeds even, but gather them in the one God and you may call your own. So when I win some triumph by some chance, render no share to Caesar. In a word, I am too proud to be a parasite. And if my nature wants the germ that grows towering to heaven like the mountain pine or like the oak sheltering multitudes, I stand, not high it may be, but alone. Yo, know, wow. So, so John, the Brett responds, alone, yes, but why stand against the world? What devil has possessed you now to go everywhere making yourself enemies? Cyrano, watching you other people making friends everywhere as a dog makes friends. I mark the manner of these canine courtesies and think my friends are of a cleaner breed. Here comes, thank God, another enemy. <laughs> I mean, this is this is just magnificent. There's no other word for this is magnificent. <laughs> it's an ode to individualism, wow. like nothing I've ever heard. And you know, my favorite line, perhaps, in definitely in the in the play, or several lines, but in most, I would have to say, of the known drama to me, is never to make a line I have not heard in my own heart. Yet with all modesty to say, my soul be satisfied with flowers, with fruit, with weeds even, but gather them in the one garden you may call your own. I mean, that is just beautiful, beautiful. It's so it's so touching. I can barely, you know, refrain from crying when you know when I read it. Well, I just think of it in my own. You know, I've taught you know, I've, I, you know, I've, I've taught literature. Uh, at, at times, and I've always, always had Cyrano on the reading list, and like, I just call that for the students, you know, the oath to, Ind to independence, and it is, yeah, it's magnificent. You know, for for, for this alone, Rustan, <laughs> Rustan should be honored on the Hero Show as a, as a literary immortal. I, I hate to even leave this scene. Yeah, I hate to even leave this scene. It's so touching. It's so profound and so necessary in, in, in today's culture where, you know, if you, if you stand up against the orthodoxy, you're going to get cancer. You know, so, so if you imagine Cyrano alive today, what he would say about the woke, you know, mentality and cancel culture and have to kowtow to this leftist orthodoxy in order, in order to be heard. I don't think Cyrano would approve. <laughs> no, I thank you, you might say. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, yeah, the, the love story. I mean, the way Cyrano loves Roxanne, uh, the way Christian loves Roxanne, the, this is the greatest love triangle. I probably, I, I could just let's drop the probably and be bold here like Cyrano himself. This is the greatest love tri triangle in the history of literature. You know, Ayn Rand wrote a beautiful one in, in We the Living, but I, but I think Cyrano is, uh, I think Cyrano takes the, takes the prize here. Uh, you know, the way the way Cyrano loves Roxanne, I mean, it's just it's so moving, uh, and it, it's 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 so beautifully done. And and of course, because he's disfigured, he's got that huge nose. He he believes Roxanne, the most beautiful of women, couldn't love him, um, and so he writes those beautiful love letters to her for his buddy Christian. 
it's 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 it really is i think it's i think i think so you know the bergerac the play i think is the greatest old to romantic love that's ever been written yeah and, and the plot twists are are just incredible i mean Ciro thinks for a moment that perhaps roxanne could love him and the way that he finds out that no it's it's not him that that she's in love with is it's just there, there's just such great tension and um, these revelations that just fall one after another and how quickly they come. It's, it's very condensed for as much as, as happens in this play. So it's, the, the writing is so compact and the plot moves along just beautifully. Um, as, as you mentioned, this love triangle drives it and right. it's only, uh, you know, for, for those who haven't read it, you know, plenty of, of spoilers coming. So you might want to pause now and and uh, and go pick it up. But um, oh yeah, good yeah, good point, John. Yeah, we can't discuss this meaningfully without discussing the ending. So this is a great play. Uh, plot spoiler alert: read the play, you'll see a great production, and then come back and watch and watch the watch the show. It's what. It's what uh, Shoshana Milgram and Ellen Kenner and I do on our, on our Atlas Shrug series that we do for the Iron Rand Center UK. Because you know, you discuss an Atlas Shrug, you got to mention a certain guy, you know, you know who's who's you know. Uh, and so we issue plot spoiler alert. Go read Atlas Shrug, you know, and then come back and and and, and watch this series. Same same here. You're right. Um, I'm sorry, John. I, I have this bad habit of interrupting you. So I'm, well, well, so what were you saying? Oh no, I was just giving the spoiler alert here before we dive into the details, the nitty gritty. Yeah, it was so touching. They're in battle against the Spanish, endless warfare on the European continent and around the world, as a matter of fact. But uh, Cyrano's writing these love letters, you know, in the name of Christian to Roxanne. He's risking his life. He's got to get through the Spanish lines, you know, to deliver, what, what, what does he say? Christian asks of how many times a day are you writing to He says twice, I think. You know, he's, he's going through the Spanish lines regularly to get these letters, these love letters off to Roxanne. And they're so beautiful, they bring Roxanne to the battlefront, right? She she comes, she comes to the battlefield because she wants she wants to be with her man, Christian. And Christian realizes Cyrano, she's in love with you. She's in love with the letters. And she goes, no, no, you know, she loves you. She loves you uh, because you're pretty, you know, your your handsome face. Christian's real. It's, it's interesting because he's a pretty boy at one level, but he's not. He's a he's a a solid soldier. He's a he's a courageous guy. He's not he's not fluent with words. He's a he's a, he's a warrior. You know, for all his Brad Pitt kind of looks. Brad Pitt may be from Troy, where he played, you know, uh, Achilles. Uh, and, and so uh, Christian's devastated here. He, he realizes the truth that Ciro doesn't realize, or, Ciro doesn't, or maybe Ciro doesn't want to realize. Uh, that he, Roxanne's in love with with the letters. She's, she's a, she, you know, she's a poetess, and she she loves the soul that goes into this. And Christian runs into in, into headlong into battle against the Spaniards, and he's killed. And of course, Roxanne loses, you know, the man that she thinks she's in love with. Uh, and Cristiano never tells her the truth. No, we, and, and we don't find out. She doesn't find out until the very end, which is one of the saddest scenes probably in all of literature and one of the most beautifully written again. Can't even talk about it without crying. Many years later, Roxanne believes she's lost the love of her life. She's in a convent. Uh, Cyrano never tells her she comes to visit her regularly. She still has the letter, you know, uh, with, uh, but what, what was, um, did Christian have one of the letters on him when he was killed? Because his, his, his blood, he did, you know, his, yeah. yeah, his blood is, is on, is on, let the let now Cyrano coming to visit her uh come to come to visit was it once every week i think for for, for years like clockwork uh is ambushed you see, you know, this independent guy who tells his enemies to you know to kiss off they drop 
you know, some, I don't know, drop some heavy object, you know, a piano or something. I don't know, up a story window on his head while he's coming to visit her. He's mortally wounded, but he's not going to miss his, his meeting with Roxanne. And he comes to her and he's, he knows he's dying. He doesn't, he doesn't want her, you know, to, to, to realize it yet. And um, he, he asks her if he can see that, that letter. She gives it to him. Starts to read it. She says, the way you, the way you say the words, you know, seeing his love coming through in, in his own words, and uh, it gets dark. It's, it's at dusk. And he's still going on. She realizes he can't read that. It's too dark for him to read. He knows the letter. And she realizes, Roxanne realizes, you wrote that letter. You know, I can't even discuss this without crying. He's, he still denies it. He's, he still denies it. She says, you, it was you all this time. You loved me. He says something, he says something like, no, my dearest love, I love you not. You know, you're right. So it's hot. It's heartbreaking. Roxanne has one of the greatest lines in all of literature. She said when she realizes she knows dying, she says, I never loved but once in life, and I lost him twice. It's so beautifully written. It's just so beautiful. Sorry, I get, and I then, get a little choked up when I discuss this. Go ahead. Completely understandable. And, and Cyrano, this independent, hardy man, you know, the, the play begins with a duel. More or less, I mean, there's a duel very close to the beginning of the play. And here at the end, he falls into delusion and he, he knows that death is coming for him and he gets in a duel with death. Uh, and and he's, he's, you know, he's hallucinating and he thinks that death is making fun of his nose. But he comes to again and, and uh, he has another moment with Roxanne where is this beautiful allusion to beauty and the beast where when the beauty kisses the beast the beast transforms into this you know gorgeous prince and and cyrano says it's not the case here uh it's not fated it's not part of this story and uh, shortly thereafter passes having never requited his love and this like we said this is the play that just wins France over to Rostand and wins the world over. It becomes a worldwide sensation. And, uh, it, you know, people, it, there's just this incredible uproar after the, the play is, is done. People don't even want to go home. They're standing outside the theater in the early hours of December 29th, 1897. These Parisians are laughing, they're crying, they're hugging, they're gesticulating. And all of them, they felt that they had just witnessed a miracle. They felt this special bond that anyone who was there that night, they, they just felt like there was this sort of brotherhood between them because what they had just seen had just totally changed their lives and made it just, just tremendous impact on the trajectory or uh, at least on the, uh, you know, the, the momentary feeling about literature in France. Yeah, and it's, this is really the power and the glory of great art, especially romantic art, because um, it's, it's, it, it shows the, the proper human stature, what the human potential is. And it, it's got this tremendous love to this benevolence, this goodwill towards human beings. So this is what we could be, uh, you know, as opposed to the naturalist school that sh shows us weak and, you know, and, you know, overwhelmed by social forces and you know, people come out of there just kind of depressed and they don't want to celebrate in the streets and hug each other and everything they're just they're, they're, they're just they're this this disconsolate whereas Cyrano is uplifting even though it's heartbreaking it's uplifting all rolled all rolled into one and by the way i have to say the tragic irony here in Cyrano in my judgment the greatest ode to romantic love ever written, the power and the value of romantic love in a human being's life. And yet, and there's three people deeply in love, and yet no love ever gets made in this story. 
Christian and Roxanne are married and, and the Christian is dragged off to battle before they can consummate their marriage. Yeah, immediately. Before the marriage can be consummated, uh, Christian was, was suicidally into the Spanish lines and is killed when he realizes that Roxanne loves Cyrano's soul rather than his face. Uh, and Cyrano never tells her the truth throughout uh, until, his, until his, she doesn't find out till he dies. And so this intense, passionate, romantic love, no love ever gets made. It's like, wow, what, what, a, what an irony, what a tragic irony in this story. And, you know, this earns, earns Rostand not only a place in literary history, but at 34, he becomes the youngest writer ever elected to the Académie Française. Um, he, following year, develops some health issues, and he's also wanting to escape the, the pressures of celebrity. And so he moves to the Basque Pyrenees, the, the French Pyrenees, to a place called Arnaga, which is now actually a, a Rostand museum. And there he can take in the beauty of nature and he you know, feels at home there. He feels far more comfortable there. And he's walking one day and he sees this sort of barnyard scene playing out, at least in his imagination. He sees this, this blackbird hopping around and sort of pestering a cock, a rooster. And, you know, in, in Rostan's imagination, at least it seemed that, the, that he was mocking the rooster. And so he turned this idea into his next play, which again, captures his idealism. But this one, I think even more, uh, e even more deliberately captures this idealism and its battle with the naturalism and the cynicism of the age. And it takes him years to write it. He has these health issues and he's just this, this perfectionist, but uh, he wants to write this role again for Coughlin, whose nickname very fittingly is Le Coq. And uh, it's this beautiful story about this rooster who believes that he causes the sun to rise with his crimson cry, you know, his, his cock-a-doodle-doo each morning. And he satirizes yeah. this mo the modernist doctrines of naturalistic art. His rooster, this rooster doesn't uh, doesn't lack for, for for hubris, does he? Does he? He <laughs> thinks he thinks that his crow, crowing is the cause of the of the sunrise. So Chanticleer. So uh, yeah, there's a there's a I, I use that. It's, it's a great play, by the way. Uh, but I use Chanticleer's initial. He learns better. But I, I use his uh, initial belief in, in my logic class. It's an example of the fallacy of false cause, you know, uh, the post hoc, post hoc fallacy, you know, post, uh, was it, uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember the Latin offhand. Um, but uh, post hoc, post -hoc ergo, ergo hoc or something. Prop to hoc, yeah, yeah, that's it. Post hoc, ergo prop to hoc, right. After this, therefore, because of this. You know, you know, and so you know, the essence of the fallacy is to confuse a temporal relationship with a causal relationship. Poor Shantika is a little confused here. He crows before the sun rises, then the sun rises. He thinks the crowing causes the sun to rise, but he finds out better, doesn't he? In a in a in a painful in a painful way. Yeah, he does, and you know, throughout he's basically it's him against these forces of irreverence and insincerity. Um, they're. they're other animals this by the way every character in the play is an animal and for animal lovers like me this is just it's awesome uh, I, I love Pateau the dog it's just a beautiful character and um, you know but the blackbird is this very insincere cynical bitter jealous bird that leads this other group of birds in a plot to assassinate Chanticleer and there's just this brilliant climax in which the forces of heroism and anti-heroism collide. And, um, you know, Chanticleer meets these other roosters who are just more concerned with their plumage and, and how they look than with, with their song, with the bird song. And he, of course, uh, thinks that he's singing the sun, sun uh, singing the, the sun to awake, but, um, you know, he, he, yes, he's disabused of this, this idea. And he nonetheless thinks, though, that the rooster's song is his life's work.
and, and his passion. Yeah, and 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 human beings need it to be awakened so they can you know so they can get up and get out to you know honest productive work. So he's he's a hero. He's uh, you know he's contributing to this uh, human productivity. Yeah, and, and Ross Stan, this is really, I, I think, um, an analogy for Ross Stan himself. Uh, you know, he's he's living amongst these forces of naturalism and cynicism and trying to take them head on. He was just this unrepentant, unrepentant romantic uh, who wanted to depict these timeless themes through uplifting uh, heroes who do noble deeds and inspire people to live better, more meaningful lives. And that's you know that's what he did in Cyrano. Uh, you know it's very unfortunate he was writing this part for Lecoq, who would have been the would have been the perfect role for the play. Lecoq actually died in 1909, the year before the play debuted, while uh, while working through it, while uh, practicing the play. He actually died with the script in his hand. It said, and wow. so it was replaced by another actor, Lucien Guitry, who really didn't get the part and. Uh, didn't perform it well. The play was not well received, at least in Paris. There was uh, it was pretty clear that, to a large extent, Bastun was mocking or that this Parisian superficial lifestyle of you know these these roosters care more about their plumage and their strut than they do about the care more about the the style than the substance. And so this mm. was a, a hardly veiled criticism of of French culture and and the Parisian culture and. and his viewers did not take kindly to it. So it, it did not meet the same uh, success that Cyrano did, at least not at first, but just right. a beautiful yeah, play Chant once again. And go ahead. That yeah, is. Yeah, Santa Claire has, has life uh, sustaining value, even, even when he's mistaken. You know, he's, he's, he's going he's to raise the sun, you know, and, you know, and, you know and, and bring the daylight. And even when he realizes, like you said, he's disabused of that notion, he realizes. I still have important work to do. I've got to get human beings out of their beds, you know, and into, uh, I don't wake them up and get them, you know, into engaging in productive work. So he's, he's pursuing, you know, really important, you know, life prom promoting values and, and not, you know, you know, not just, you know, how do I look or, you know, uh, am I, am I, does, does, again, in the Fountainhead, uh, Guy Frank and Guy Francon. Knows the French name. He knows how to match his ties with his socks and his wines with his meals and his his very stylish and his etiquette is perfect. But he's a lousy designer, <laughs> you know. Whereas Henry Cameron doesn't know how to match his his ties with his socks uh, or his wine with his meals. Henry Cameron probably doesn't drink wine. He drinks whiskey, you know. But he's <laughs> he's. <laughs> He's the great, but he's the great designer, like you said, John. Substance over style, and that's 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 heroic. You know, the the, the pursuit of life, uh, you know, life advancing values in the teeth of any and all obstacles, and that's Chanticleer, and that's uh, and that's and that's Rostand's romantic ethos against the you know the naturalism of his day. He worships the sun. He says it at one point. I worship thee, O sun, whose ample light, blessing every forehead, ripening every fruit, entering every flower and every hovel, pours itself forth and yet is never less, still spending and unspent like mother's love. It's poetry. And, and I think we mentioned earlier that Rastan considered himself, although he, he wrote these very famous plays, he considered himself first and foremost a poet. And he wrote his plays in poetic verse. Yes, he did. And to tie this, go back to Cyrano again, and maybe you know, wrap this pack. Well, we will. Well, you know, let me do that at the end, um, in a couple of minutes. So Rostand's in the uh, in the French Basque countryside because he's suffering from pleurisy, right? Uh, inflammation of of the lungs, and then post World War One, of course, nineteen eighteen, the years following, for two or three years following, there's a terrible. Spanish flu pandemic, which claims the lives of tens of millions. I've seen estimates going as, uh, going as high as 100 million worldwide. And that's from a much smaller, you know, human population around the world 100 years ago than today. So it's a huge percentage of human beings who are you know, tragically killed by this terrible ailment. And uh, 
Unfortunately, Rostan's one of them. His life cut short at age 50. Uh, his maybe may have been in his in his peak years if he was living today and, and could could have lived to 80 or 85, you know, God only knows what what masterpieces he might have produced, although he would have had to go a long way to equal, never mind to exceed Cyrano de Bergerac. Absolutely. <laughs> But she, he wasn't even 30 when, uh, when that was produced for the first time. So, you know, I'm going to tie this up. Um, isn't it fitting that the young boy who grew up in a household whose father translated Catullus, the most passionate love poet that you could, that you could ever find, ended up uh, composing or, or, or writing the greatest ode to romantic love that's ever been written in, in Cyrano, Cyrano de Bergerac. I think his, I think his father would have been pleased, John. <laughs> that's Absolutely. pure speculation on my part. But let's put it this way. Yeah, he would have rational reason to be pleased. People could be irrational, but and Mon gave him real, you know, you know, justified reasons to be to be pleased. Um, so there he is with that. Great mustache. And anything else to be said on the great man, John? Or should we should we wrap this up? Well, you you know you hit my favorite passage in in Cyrano. Uh, there's another really good one from Chanticleer that we can end with. He's talking to the blackbird sure. and about you know what Ayn Rand later called second handedness. This this. Uh, Care, caring more for what others think of you than about the, the values that you actually hold for yourself. And he says to the blackbird, having taken from the sparrow only his makeup and grimace, you are just a clumsy understudy, a sort of vice buffoon, and you serve up stale old cynicisms, picked up with crumbs and fashionable club rooms, poor little bird, and think to astonish us with your budget of scandalous news. So Chanticleer <laughs> standing for the, the total opposite of this naturalism, cynicism, romanticism, uh, standing up for Rustan's heroism, just as had Cyrano. Yep. Take your cynical, scandalous gossip, little bird. Take it somewhere else, because I am going to wake humanity up so that they can get to the, so that they can get to productive work. See the, you see the difference between you know somebody who's a tr trivia monger, a scandal monger, and somebody who's got real you know powerful life supporting values. Well, John, I think we did justice to the great man, you know, the one of the one of the great the, the author of the three greatest plays in history, as <laughs> Ayn Rand as Ayn Rand said, and I think we could uh, I think at this point I'm gonna John I'm gonna salute uh edmond rostan and i'm gonna wish you to have a more heroic day my friend everybody out there in hero land have a heroic weekend we'll see you next week on the hero show